Good afternoon and welcome to Hudson Institute. My name is Peter Rao. I'm a senior fellow here at Hudson focusing on American foreign policy with a special emphasis on Europe and the transatlantic relationship. It's my pleasure to moderate today's panel entitled An Emerging G2? Question mark, Prospects for Transatlantic Tech uh, Cooperation. We're presenting today's panel on the same day that uh, senior negotiators or officials are meeting in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to inaugurate the Transatlantic Trade and Technology Council. The so-called uh, TTC was born in Brussels early June when President Biden on a swing through Europe met with the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. The two of them announced uh, the uh, TTC. And perhaps before I introduce our marvelous panel today, I would just take a minute uh, to update those viewers who might not be familiar with the TTC, what it is and why it is that we think it's important to have this conversation today. So the TTC, the Trade and Technology Council, is the not quite successor to the ill-fated Transatlantic Trade and Investment Pact, which was more of a classic free trade negotiation, which died an ugly death at the end of the Obama administration. It's really more of a mechanism within which Europe and the United States can talk about those technologies which really will underpin power in the 21st century. And then also additional priorities that matter a great deal to both sides of the Atlantic, to the Biden administration in Europe, like, for example, green technologies. So it includes a lot of those areas in 10 working groups that one might expect uh, to matter to both sides and which will uh, shape the future of the 21st century, from supply chains and semiconductors to standard setting in areas like robotics or artificial intelligence. It also includes working groups on export controls to make sure that key technologies don't flow to pernicious and malicious state actors abroad or non-state actors. And it also includes uh, a investment screening working group. Of course, the US has the famed CFIUS project, uh, the uh, Committee on Foreign Investment Screening in the United States. And so greater alignment on screening inbound FDI foreign direct investment is also an ambition of the uh, Transatlantic uh, Trade and Technology Council. Today's meeting uh, in Pittsburgh is very high level. It includes two cabinet secretaries, the Secretaries of State and Commerce, as well as the USTR, the United States Trade Rep. And the Europeans are gracing us with their presence with two vice presidents of uh, the European uh, Commission. So a, a very important meeting, a very high level meeting. And at the risk of segging a little bit from moderator to panelists, perhaps I'll just say a word or two about what I think are the motivations behind the US and the Europeans launching this council. On the American side, I think it's clear that the US would like to try and win over Europe for the broader competition it sees unfolding uh, with the Chinese. The Europeans are a bit hesitant uh, about this because they neither wish to endorse the threat perception, I think, that has become standard analysis in Washington and in the United States, nor do they wish to see Sino-American competition descend into what they perceive to be an unnecessary Cold War. On the European side, uh, I think, it's always a great thing for the European Commission to be considered a peer of the United States executive. The European Commission is constantly fighting for legitimacy in Europe and trying to overcome what amounts to a bit of a democratic deficit. And so that alone, I think, is for it uh, a plus and a, bon and a bonus. And beyond that, Europe uh, and the European Commission has used the European consumer market, the vast market that is the European single market, to try to muscle its way in imposing its view of social policy and regulation in this new frontier, the digital domain on uh, outside actors, including the United States. We've already seen this when it comes to digital governance and transatlantic data flows, where uh, there's been an imbroglio over the last several years about the nature of transatlantic data flows, privacy versus national security considerations, et cetera, et cetera. So the Europeans view the US as a bit of a digital wild west, I would argue as well, in particular post 2013, when Ed Snowden uh, made his res re revelations and, uh, and has had growing support at home for a tough regulatory agenda. In the US, uh, perhaps less so amongst the Biden administration, which uh, in the Democratic Party, I think over decades has had a bit more of a regulatory footprint uh, than perhaps some free marketeers. But in general, I would say there is a worry or a concern that uh, the innovative basis of America's technological progress might be undermined a bit by the European regulatory agenda, and so one must tread carefully. We saw this also in TTIP, where there was a concern that transatlantic regulatory alignment may lead to harmonization at the European level rather than simple 
regulatory recognition. And so there, I think, is partially the American reservation of what the Europeans think is a great advantage here. But given that it is the Biden administration and the Democrats, and I think there's a changing landscape in American politics, some Republicans, too, are more apt to impose regulations on our uh, technology sector. There is more of an interest in, in perhaps moving in this direction and trying to work together. So, so much for the important meeting that's taking place today, the key mechanism or channel through which uh, the transatlantic community is trying to get a handle on these new economic frontiers that we are facing. And I could have no better than these three panelists to talk about both sides of the Atlantic, the technological landscape, the prospects for cooperation, or the hurdles to that cooperation going forward. First, we have Nadia Shadlow, a colleague of mine at Hudson Institute, who came to Hudson from uh, the National Security Council. She was the Deputy National Security Council in the Trump administration, and she's widely credited as being the intellectual force and the author behind the 2017 uh, national security strategy. You can see she's uh, a hard worker given that national security strategies tend not to come out in the first year of an administration, but she managed uh, to pull off that feat. Before that, she was the senior program officer at the Smith Richardson uh, Foundation, and she has published widely, much of what you can see on the Hudson website. I encourage you to check out her work there, including a piece I particularly enjoyed on battery technologies, since this is a technology session today in the national interest a few months back. Joining us from Berlin is an American, Tyson Barker, who works at the German Council on Foreign Relations, the German acronym being DGAP. He is there the head of the Digital and Global Affairs Program. Tyson is uh, a longstanding tech expert. He has a lively Twitter account where he talks not only about German politics, but also very substantively about these tech issues. I encourage you to check that out and his website uh, for his many writings. Tyson previously was at the Aspen Institute where he was executive, uh, deputy executive director. And he also spent time at the Bertelsmann Foundation on transatlantic issues. Tyson is an alumnus of the Obama administration and uh, one of the nicest guys around. So thanks a lot for joining us today, Tyson. And last but certainly not least is uh, my other Hudson colleague, Tom Dusterberg, um, who works on transatlantic uh, trade and, and, and technology issues. Uh, Tom is uh, also an alum of the Aspen Institute, like Tyson. He um, ran the uh, ma Manufacturing and um, Society in the 21st Century program as executive director. He has government experience as Assistant Secretary of Commerce and as a senior aide to Congressman Chris Cox and uh, the, at the time, Senator Dan Quayle. Um, and uh, Tom spent a lot of time at the Manufacturing Alliance as president and CEO from 1999 to 2011. And this is his second go round, at least as far as I know, at Hudson Institute. Uh, so thanks, Tom, for joining us today. So um, I thought I would begin with uh, asking Nadia to spend a little bit of time on the United States, on the state of, of the American technological landscape, the lay of the land, as it were. Uh, and in particular, given that um, uh, supply chains and semiconductors are up for discussion in Pittsburgh and generally will accompany us over the coming years, I thought I'd ask her to talk about that about the state of uh, AI policy in the US or artificial intelligence, and lastly, perhaps about industrial policy to which I'm sure we'll return over the course of the next hour. Nadia, thanks for joining us and uh, look forward to hearing your opening comments. Uh, thanks, Peter, and thanks so much uh, for inviting me. I look forward to the discussion with Tyson and Tom and to learning from, from them because they actually follow these issues very, very closely. So my comments will be more in the spirit of, of framing some of the issues, and then I'd love to hear what, what the three of you have to say. Um, first, you know, why are we having this discussion in the first place? Why is this committee meeting? I mean, ultimately, you know, technology is critical to national power. Some have called it the fourth industrial revolution, not, not a great term, but essentially institutions haven't kept up with the revolutionary changes we're seeing right across the board. Markets, uh, while, have, while they've driven much of this technological change, have also created vulnerabilities in things like supply chains. Educational systems, at least in the United States, haven't kept up. I'd love to hear what Tyson has to say about this in Germany. Our secondary educational system is not producing the next generation of technologists. We've been saying this for 10 years, nothing has changed. Budget processes remain very, very slow while technology moves fast that creates disconnects. And our acquisition process in terms of our government being more adept with new technologies, acquiring new systems, platforms, not just in the national security space, but across the board remains you know, sclerotic, no matter how often we seem to try to improve these areas. So really the list goes on. 
clearly the United States has a lot to do at home, but that doesn't mean it can't and shouldn't also be working with allies, right? So we're seeing the needs for both simultaneously. But in terms of the TTC specifically, I think there are three things that strike me that we really need to think about in terms of uh, the US and the broader set of meetings. First, we still don't really seem to want to prioritize and in certain areas. There are 10 working groups of the TTC. That's a lot, <laughs> 10 areas. Um, that means that it's gonna be very hard to coordinate and actually make progress across all 10. So why not, in my mind, you know, prioritize on um, privacy shield, uh, issues related to data protection, which is a key issue that underscores all of the other uh, tech-related cooperation. Standards, very important. Keep in mind that in addition to these 10 working groups of the TTC, we have a bunch of working groups that the Quad just established last week, right? The US, India, Japan, Australia, also on standards. So as usual, I, I'm always skeptical of these um, multilateral processes just for these reasons. I think in a year, we're gonna see updates on meetings and not so much on outcomes. Uh, second, in terms of what's happening in the US related to this, you know, the signals are mixed here. Uh, we, haven't really, we haven't really decided on a theory of the case regarding how to improve uh, the situation reg regarding microchips and semiconductors, that is, how do we ensure that the vulnerabilities um, that are out there, our ability to get certain types of microchips when we need them quickly, uh, how do we mitigate those vulnerabilities? Right now, most of that chip production uh, is offshore, Taiwan and Asia, right? So we've been dealing with this as a country for several years now. The problem is we still remain at a standstill. Uh, there was a famous piece of legislation, or at least you know, in our circles, <laughs> called the CHIPS Act, which later got subsumed into a larger piece of legislation. Uh, called the American Innovation and Competitiveness Act. And that's now uh, at a standstill on, on Capitol Hill on the House side, it passed the Senate. So while for about 18 months, we've been discussing a uh, supposed $52 billion in additional funding in the sphere, it sort of, it remains at a standstill because we can't figure out where to put that funding and how to spend that money. Should it go into early stage R&D? Should it go into manufacturing facilities? And I know Tom can talk about this too, so I'd love to hear your views. So again, this, this is going to create, um, I think some disconnects between progress in the TTC and uh, unresolved US debates at home. Uh, similarly, you know, I'd, I'd argue that you don't wanna start from scratch, right? So every time you read about these new processes, new meetings, everyone's starting from scratch and we shouldn't. The Biden administration did a decent job at articulating some of supply chain vulnerabilities in the semiconductor space, as well as in the battery space and in, in the pharmaceutical area. So start from, you know, the research has already been done there, right? Don't start from scratch and hopefully these working groups won't. Um, keep in mind the AI National uh, Commission on Artificial Intelligence. That was a two year long commission. It came up with a lot of really specific recommendations on how to keep US technological edge in this domain, as well as uh, with allies and partners. So begin from thinking about how to implement some of those well thought out recommendations, right? I think unfortunately, um, everyone wants to sort of re reinvent the wheel. So overall, I think that those are some of the, the main challenges sort of facing the, the TTC today, a prioritization, building on existing sets of recommendations, and working through differences in the United States uh, regarding industrial policy, part of the problem in the semiconductor space, uh, there is a real disconnect still on how involved the US government should be, and if there should be involvement, what um, on, across what part of that supply chain should the government be involved early research and development, mid-range, the building of very expensive fabrication facilities. So uh, those are issues that are, I think are gonna, we'll see them reappear as these discussions in Pittsburgh go on. Thank you. Thanks, Nadia. Um, I just comment that I would I share your view. I have a piece coming out in the next couple of days that not having privacy shield, privacy shield um, embedded in these first round of negotiations or at least high on the agenda, is probably a missed opportunity, but um, hopefully this doesn't just become a process oriented uh, topic. Tyson, maybe you could take it from there and give us a view. You sit in Berlin, I know you're an American, but you can give us a lay of the land on the European side. And also uh, I know you've uh, been quoted in the press as having uh, having a close read on what's taking place in Pittsburgh. What's your, what's your sense of the TTC? 
Well, uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation uh, to Hudson and for having me. Uh, this is a great round. I'm really honored to be here. Um, I, maybe I can start with why Pittsburgh. Uh, Pittsburgh in many ways represents what the hope is that the TTDC represents, namely a city that used to be based on coal and steel, a real representation of kind of an industrial uh, titan uh, that's transformed itself into a research hub for robotics and artificial intelligence. And in many ways, this is the hope for the transatlantic uh, innovation industrial base itself. So I think that that's part of the reason why Pittsburgh was chosen, and I think it couldn't have been a better choice personally. Um, maybe just to start with what the EU is coming to the table with uh, would, be, would be a good place to start. Um, so for many years, the EU has been pushing a digital agenda, um, but it has primarily been focused on regulation and completing the digital single market. It has not seen necessarily the kind of geopolitical underpinnings of a technological relationship as it's developed over the past 10 to 15 years. Um, and that has caught Europe a little bit off guard uh, with the rise of new general purpose technologies, uh, the prevalence of, of chokeholds, choke points, um, and supply chain uh, brittleness, and the way that these technologies can be used both for civilian and military purposes. Um, so Europe has been kind of shifting its focus away from an emphasis on the digital single market to something that we hear a lot about uh, in this commission, which is technological sovereignty or digital sovereignty. Um, and there's, of course, a lot of questions about what this term even means. And that strategic ambiguity is really important to the term itself uh, because it, it encapsulates a vision of um, tech policy uh, that appeals to both the Germans and the French but in very different ways. And I have to say that the Franco-German motor is, is essential to understand if you wanna understand how Europe is approaching uh, digital technology and tech policy in general. So for the Germans, uh, they have a very ordo liberal uh, interpretation of that term. It's about openness of the economy. It's about creating the space for competition. It's about uh, preserving uh, informational self-determination in the form of uh, privacy and data protection rights. Uh, it's about uh, open source ability. Uh, it's about clear rules of the game. Those are kind of the emphases that, that Germany has when it talks about digital sovereignty. When the French talk about digital sovereignty, um, they're talking about uh, um, uh, industrial substitution based, in, uh, excuse me, uh, import substitution based industrialization in the tech sphere. I, basically, they want to grow an indigenous industry uh, in uh, new emerging technologies. And sometimes these areas overlap. Um, if you look at, for example, the Gaia X project, or if you look at discussions around uh, semiconductors, there's a lot of overlap between the two or discussions around data protection, but there are places where they diverge. And maintaining that strategic ambiguity has been something uh, creating tension within the European Union and will create some tension, obviously, with Europe's relationships with its partners like the United States. So moving into this era of digital sovereignty post COVID, uh, the European Union and its member states have also been pursuing a more proactive industrial policy, proactive tech industrial policy. Uh, we all saw last year that the European Union rolled out uh, 750 billion euros for uh, the next generation EU pact, 20% of which should be dedicated to the digital transformation. So that's 150 billion euros that should be used in this area. And they've rolled out a, a set of targets uh, in a document that came out this March called the Digital Compass, which included among other things, uh, the ability to produce 20% of the globe's high-end semiconductors within Europe. Uh, that is a quite an ambitious goal. Uh, there are a lot of questions about how to get there, but that is definitely going to be a topic of discussion at the TTC and elsewhere. At the same time, a lot of member states themselves are produ uh, pursuing uh, industrial policies. Uh, in the state that I'm sitting in, Germany, which just had an election this week, um, there are new plans for uh, 5 billion euro investment in artificial intelligence, a 2 billion euro investment in open RAN, a 2 billion euro investment in um, quantum computing, and that's just at the federal level. Member states themselves, particularly Bavaria and Baden-Württemberg, are also doing a lot. Um, in addition to that, uh, the European Union is pursuing this new tool that it has called IPSIZE, Important Projects of Common European Interest, which allows it to skirt certain state aid rules, uh, which will be uh, bring together uh, public sector players and private sector players in consortia 
to get to basically leapfrog uh, certain areas of, of technological development and develop the next generation of technology in areas like 6G, cloud, uh, and semiconductors, et cetera. The other area I should focus on, not just on industrial policy, of course, is on regulation, because Europe is well known for producing regulation. In fact, they're quite proud in some ways of being the world's uh, you know, global referee. Uh, they point to GDPR as a global gold standard. Uh, in the past uh, nine to 10 months have been a real um, big bang of new regulatory drafts coming out on everything from the Digital Markets Act, which looks to regulate digital gatekeepers, uh, the Digital Services Act, which looks to regulate speech and uh, uh, illegal content online, uh, the AI Act, which looks at look, uh, regulating risk-based artificial intelligence, social scoring, and real-time remote biometric identification, uh, and other pieces of regulation that are coming out in the near future, including the Data Act, which will look at industrial data, and uh, new cloud rules. So that's the kind of that's the kind of set of issues that that Europe is coming to the table with when they come to Pittsburgh. A lot of ambition, both on the industrial policy side and on the regulatory policy side, uh, but also a lot of questions about what the United States is looking to do with this new Biden administration. And I will save my comments about the TTC itself for the discussion, but I'll say a couple of things what Europe wants to see not happen necessarily. Europe has four no's, I would say, when it, when it comes to Pittsburgh, four, four kind of red lines about what the TTC is not. It is not a, a TTIP strikes back, this is not TTIP 2.0, and they will make it very clear that they're trying to avoid issues from uh, investment uh, dispute settlement mechanisms to chlorinated chicken to everything to deal with agriculture, et cetera. Um, it is not for them an anti-China alliance. Although if you look at the texts of the communiques, there's a lot of language that is quite pointed uh, in the direction of China, incl including questions about civil military fusion. Uh, they would say it's not an area to negotiate privacy shield. Um, and they would say this for a couple of reasons. One is the DG, the Directorate General that's responsible for those negotiations is not involved in TTC, that's a DG just. Um, but there are also other reasons for that, which we can get into in the discussion. And the fourth is it's not an area to negotiate or discuss active draft legislation that is currently before member states and the European Parliament, i.e. They don't want this to be a venue to discuss the Digital Markets Act, this big pace of legislation that is looking to regulate online gatekeepers. So those are their four no's. Let me just take a lot of, I mean, I'm an American sitting in Berlin, but I have a lot of empathy for those no's. Um, and let me give you some of the dangers that exist with the TTC in Europe that don't necessarily exist in the United States, which is some of the reason behind some of those, those red lines. The first is the potential, and we're already seeing this a little bit, that a narrative, a disinformation narrative, a conspiracy theory narrative, develops that this is a behind closed doors negotiation between the commission, the US uh, government, and what is called here GAFA, or uh, Google, Apple, Facebook, and Amazon. That this is a vehicle for those four companies to get what they want in areas like data governance uh, and competition law. And that kind of narrative, if it develops, could be quite mobilizing uh, in Europe, which we saw with TTIP, um, which was also backed incidentally by uh, top cover online from, from Russian uh, disinformation actors. And we could only imagine that the Chinese would really benefit from instrumentalizing or weaponizing that kind of narrative if it were to metastasize in Europe. Uh, the second is the question of the hub and spoke system that some in Brussels and Berlin and other places see developing in the United States. There's questions about how much the US is going to emphasize taking some of the quad deliverables and basically hoisting it cut and paste onto Europe. That's probably not going to work if that's the intention of Washington. And the third, and this is an inter-European problem, but we saw it with uh, this past week, is what, what Peter mentioned. The Commission wants a peer relationship with the United States, but the member states prize their relationships with the United States. And so to the extent that it looks like the Commission is deriving legitimacy from this peer relationship, member states themselves are going to question that and say, well, actually, we're the ones in charge here. 
Uh, and we saw this in the AUKUS spat with France, where France basically threatened to derail, postpone, really bloodied up this, this process a little bit last week, um, where France said, you know, the commission isn't really in charge. Their authority derives from big states like France and Germany, and Germany backed them up on this. So it's going to be really important to get member state buy-in for this process if it's to work. And I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Tyson. I suppose if if um, if there is a danger that embedding data governments in the TTC derails it altogether, and you just have a different directorate negotiate in parallel, that's okay. I'll, I was just surprised that it wasn't on the agenda, given that data governance is one of the ten working groups, and the subset of issues they mentioned within data governance are tailor made for Privacy Shield, and clearly it's important. But anyways, and a last observation I'll make: when you mentioned the Big Bang of uh, of regulations coming out, I think it was you who had a panel with Eric Schmidt recently who, uh, who, who, who named the explainer rule within the artificial intelligence uh, regulation as a disaster or catastrophe or some really uh, hyperbolic um, a description. The explainer rule being that, that humans need to be able to explain the AI processes if there is somebody who comes back and asks how a certain result came to, came to be in an AI um, in an AI process. But anyways, that's just another example of regulation versus innovation, not clashing, but there at least being a bit of tension. With that, to our three slot hitter, Tom Dusterberg, uh, if you want to take us home on what this all means, opportunities, friction points um, between Europe and the US. Okay, like uh, Nadia, I'm looking forward to uh, a fulsome exchange with, uh, with all of you. Uh, I have a lot to learn. Um, uh, I'm going to start with um, sort of a somewhat pessimistic view uh, about the prospects, at least in the near term, for this exercise. Um, and um, Tyson's list of four no's, which has a Chinese ring to it, just in terms of the phrasing, um, it, uh, strikes me as uh, reinforcing what I am going to say. Um, first of all, on the American side, uh, the, the Biden administration is totally focused on the domestic agenda. Um, and everything that's going to happen, I think, in the next three months this, this year is going to be dedicated to using the political capital that they have to get their domestic agenda in as a robust a form as they can, get it through to the finish line. Uh, they're not going to uh, uh, think about... Uh, in my view, um, larger issues on the international front. I think the, the way they handled Afghanistan, they just wanted to get it off the table. It was a disaster, uh, partly because of that. Um, so there's, there's that. Um, then as Tyson mentioned, it's, there's a, it's always difficult to get consensus in, in the European Union. And uh, I can't improve on the list of issues that he um, uh, talked about there. Uh, then we have the current events, the German elections, the need to uh, reestablish a, a leadership team there, French anger um, on a variety of fronts, but <laughs> reinforced by the uh, decision on the submarines. I, I would say you know, East Europe um, is not easy, always easy to bring into the fold to, to develop a consensus in, in Europe. And now we have um, up, up, they're upset by the Nord, Nord Stream decision. They're upset by the criticism that they're on the other end of uh, for human rights, immigration. Um, finally, the uh, European, especially the German uh, reluctance to uh, choose sides on China, it, it, I think is an impediment to uh, really, at least near term uh, accomplishments. Uh, with the, uh, with the meeting this week, at least. Um, then there are longstanding differences um, uh, between the United States and, um, and Europe, on, mostly on the trade front, but it spills over into regulation, regulatory policy um, as well. Um, the trade right now in the United States is a, <clears throat> is a third rail. Nobody wants to touch it. Um, and again, because of the focus on domestic policy, uh, the Biden folks are not going to take any chances. Um, they're not even really, 
in my view, reviewing China policy in any serious way yet. I think they will, but um, so, um, but there are longstanding major differences. Tyson mentioned a couple of them, agriculture, uh, the perception at least that antitrust is aimed at the United States, uh, digital giants. This new Digital uh, Services Act um, may reinforce that. Um, it's focused on the five largest platforms. Um, and uh, amongst other things, there are some who criticize it because it allows, in, in the interest of um, transparency, uh, the transfer of data to research uh, institutions. Now, uh, Tyson's can help me with this. Does that include China if they, if they request it? Uh, I mean, so I'll look forward to your, your answer on that, but there's suspicion in the United States that a lot of these policies, regulatory policies, uh, aren't uh, as robustly enforced with regard to uh, China. Um, I would also note um, in the near term, I don't think Europe has the scale to be a real competitor with China in industrial policy. And if the United States goes ahead with um, the, uh, the, the bills that uh, Nadia mentioned, the CHIPS Act uh, being the most prominent, and we put in another $100, 200000000000 billion, uh, can, can Europe um, compete with that? Can they compete with, because of the distribution of, of power, even if you have a robust centralized industrial policy, Who's going to get the twenty or thirty billion for a uh, advanced semiconductor plant? I don't. I I think that's a problem. Um, finally, um, on, on the negative side, I'm I'm nervous about the United States uh, overall policy. There's been an attack uh, in the last 10, 20 years on uh, intellectual property law. The uh, erosion of patent standards, the ability to get um, injunctions for um, um, contraventions of, of patents. Uh, now the Biden administration wants to uh, get a waiver on the, uh, the uh, COVID vaccine. Uh, all of this adds up to uh, plus, I, I would note the macro policy of the Biden administration amongst other things, um, um, going to support the green, um, green technology, we're just not competitive in that. We're not competitive in solar production of solar panels, wind, um, and we're, uh, the Biden administration wants to erode the ability of the uh, fossil fuel industry uh, to be an engine of growth in our economy. Finally, taxation. Um, if, by, if suggested, the mooted uh, tax plans uh, are passed, uh, then we'll be the high, highest, have the highest corporate tax rates in the OECD world again, higher than China as well. So I, I would just suggest, uh, I would still like to see this process move forward. I think their less ambitious goals are what we ought to focus on. Uh, I have a little list here. I'll just go through it. Um, Tyson mentioned the German program on open RAN. I think the uh, uh, some of that um, uh, EU wide money could be used for that. I believe the Italians are looking at that as well. Um, that's an area where there's complementarity. Um, Europe has the hardware, we have the software. Um, so that might be an area to, to pursue. In terms of battery technology, um, I think both both sides want to put a lot of money into becoming self-sufficient in batteries. I, um, but we're still look at, looking at lithium ion batteries. Why can't we put some money into uh, really advanced research see if there, there isn't another um, um, technology out there that would be, uh, could be scaled up? Um, China's already captured you know, the entire supply chain for battery technology anyway. So 
that's an area I'd like to look at. Uh, quantum computing, again, some complementarity of, of technologies. Uh, I think we need to solve this privacy shield um, uh, issue. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how to do it, but it's, it's extremely important to the US economy. Um, and I don't see how you go forward un unless we can get a good resolution to that. One sort of, out of outside the box uh, idea, and maybe it's not really the um, uh, this meeting that uh, can uh, look at that, but we have this dispute over the World Trade Organization. And as both of us move smartly towards uh, you know national champions in industrial policy, uh, there's some danger we're going to totally undermine the World Trade Organization. We have this appellate body dispute, um, which on the U.S. side is has its origins in the decisions of the appellate body outside, at least their interpretation outside the uh, what they thought they had negotiated and put into the rules of the WTO. Uh, so it's all on anti. Uh, um, uh, a, B, C, V, D. Um, um, Europe calls this uh, trade defense measures and is trying to ramp up their ability to uh, deploy trade defense measures. Um, so if the United States is right uh, within the WTO, maybe that would be an area where they could find a resolution to the appellate body problem um, and develop some momentum um, AI standards, both of you mentioned that, um, export controls. Um, so in the longer run, hopefully we'll move on some of these uh, confidence building measures, if you will. I think from what I can tell, reading the European uh, um, commentary and the commentary of the business community, I think there's a growing recognition that China's uh, Chinese mercantilism is a real problem. Um, and maybe at some point, uh, not this year, but in future years, we can uh, talk a little bit more plainly about uh, what to do about uh, working together on uh, uh, countering the Chinese practices. Anyway, gone on too long, but um, there's lots of stuff that's very interesting to cover. Thanks, Tom. It may be just because you had those questions directly. Tyson, do you have any thoughts on the draft Digital Markets Act on transferring sensitive data or code to third parties without geographic restrictions? And then also where the money would go, I think, was the other thing Tom might have. And not sure. to take over the role of moderator, but I would like Tyson then also to explain, because I think it's important, um, how important that, that data issue is to tech cooperation in areas like artificial intelligence and other areas. So that's what I'm having trouble kind of grappling with. How can you not resolve the data issue um, and not have an impact on these other areas of cooperation. That's right, Nadia, I became a panelist in my introduction, so you can become a moderator during the <laughs> I, always, I always tend to take over as a moderator <laughs> flaw. Hi, Tyson. So, so uh, first of all, not to be outdone by uh, US sloganeering, um, the European Union has introduced its own CHIPS Act, uh, the European CHIPS Act, which has three parts. Um, a European semiconductor research strategy, uh, a plan to enhance uh, production capacity and a framework for international cooperation and partnership. Um, this was announced in uh, Ursula von der Leyen's State of the Union address about three weeks ago or two weeks ago. The problem is it didn't have a price tag attached to it uh, yet. And so people are asking the question, where's, where's the money or what's the plan? Of course, the European Union has the Horizon Europe program, which is an R&D program over the next seven years, which is looking at spending about 95.5 billion euros. Um, and then there's the, um, the recovery and resilience facility. So are they going to, are they just rebranding some of that spending? Is that going to be an area where they're looking to uh, redirect some of that money and in creating indigenous production capacity beyond R&D. And it should be stated that Europe's past um, track record in spending on industrial policy has been primarily focused on R&D and it's had a real trouble uh, commercializing a lot of that R&D. So are they going a bit uh, further downstream on the, the production cycle? It seems that they want to go there, but 
as uh, Tom mentioned, you know, picking locations for fabs and that kind of thing is, is really tough. That's politically sensitive kind of stuff. And it's hard for a, a, a state like the, like the United States to do that. If you're talking about 27 member states, you're really picking winners. And that's, that's difficult. So we're getting into some very politically uh, sensitive territory, but actually I think this is gonna come up in the transatlantic context in the midterm as well. And one data point to add, we're having this first meeting on Thursday in Pittsburgh, where they're gonna talk about short-term uh, objectives in supply chain, or excuse me, in semiconductors, primarily focused around supply chain security and resilience. But they do wanna create a roadmap for mid and long-term objectives. And I think that some of that has to do with R&D and produ production capabilities. And the next meeting of the TTC is slated to take place in spring of 2022, during the French EU presidency. So it will take place in France, most likely, um, right before a French election, I might add. Um, so if you're a kind of political prognosticator, you can think about where some of that, that effort might, might start to gel. On the open RAN question, um, I, I agree it makes a lot of sense in the German-American context, but this is where things get difficult. Germany has become a big supporter of open RAN because of Deutsche Telekom, because it wants to have cheap mobile network equipment. But Europe has two champions that produce mobile network equipment and have a lock in the global market, Nokia and Ericsson. So even though the Germany itself is pursuing an open RAN industrial strategy, that is quite controversial in Brussels and with countries like France, which oppose mentioning that in the G7 communique in uh, the UK. So uh, again, we're getting uh, you know, conflicting objectives within the European Union, very, very complicated um, uh, interests and dynamics. On Privacy Shield, although it is officially not part of the TTC process, it is, to put it diplomatically, adjacent to the TTC process. There is live negotiations taking place and everybody is aware of the urgency. Um, I had some conversations with one of the negotiators from DG Just a couple of weeks ago. And the United States, the Department of Commerce keeps coming back with ideas, um, but they're not getting to the level of, and I don't want to get into the technical details, but it's not getting into the level of independent uh, redress that the European Union would like to see to make sure that it, the process has credibility. Um, and it's not just a bilateral front that the European Union and the United States have been kind of uh, duking it out on this issue. They've also had very tough discussions at the OECD where uh, the European Union has rejected any kind of interim agreements that focus on policy frameworks, favoring changes in legislation. Um, so Europe is coming into a difficult time, not just with the United States, which is kind of its it's the canary in the coal mine on, on pri data privacy. This is how Europe wants to interact with the rest of the world, given the GDPR framework. The standard contractual clauses, which are the other mechanism by which Europe interacts, require that states that it transfers data to have what they call adequacy, basically the same standards that the European Union has. But can we, do we really believe that India, which does not have an adequacy agreement, has similar standards to the European Union or China or so many other potential partners? Do we really believe that uh, some countries that have adequacy, including the UK and uh, Israel, would withstand uh, scrutiny by the European Court of Justice? I think it's difficult to make that case. So the question is, how does Europe want to interact with the whole world? in maintaining an order that allows the free flow of personal data. It's not just a question for the United States. The sad thing is, is that has been really uh, compartmentalized in the transatlantic relationship. And that has been part of the problem. And there are two reasons for that. Two reasons it's a problem. One is all the enforcement uh, firepower has been directed towards the United States. And I think that that has been just acknowledged. Um, that's partially a product of the fact that the US had great platforms that developed early on. Um, but as we are seeing uh, Chinese platforms globalize, um, the scrutiny needs to be turned towards other actors in this space in order to maintain credibility for the data protection authorities. And the second is, 
in the dynamic, the negotiating dynamic with Privacy Shield, you have the United States negotiators from the Department of Commerce, you have tech companies, and you have um, the intelligence community on the one side. That's the US side. And then on the European side, you have the European Commission negotiating in good faith with at its back, watching it closely, NGOs, uh, privacy bound NGOs, the European Court of Justice, and uh, the data protection authorities in the member states. What you don't have are European tech companies, which exist. In fact, every company is a tech company because all these auto companies are gonna be transferring personal data if they're planning on having connected cars. You don't have member state governance, governments, including their intelligence communities saying, why is this important for us to maintain this relationship? So you have a, a big asymmetry in the negotiating dynamic, which also causes problems. So even beyond the, the letter of the law, the political atmospherics are not right for a durable solution quite yet. Um, but both sides are looking to get a solution by November before a decision comes down dealing with Facebook, which could really make things more difficult. Uh, that said, it's still, I think we're still a little ways away. Um, it's, it's really tough. Thanks, Tyson. That's really interesting. Um, <clears throat> maybe I'll just try to bring this back up to the to the global level, since you just sort of uh, hinted at it, and ask how this transatlantic relationship and negotiation nests within kind of the broader American strategy in the world, given the Quad statement that came out and the meeting that uh, the president had. I mean, are these are these Nadia mentioned it um, that the U.S. is charging forward? Do these have compatibility? Is there going to be tension? Um, the Europeans have to decide how to deal with the world, but the Americans also now have not competing multilateral frameworks, but they do have or seem to be forging new relationships. How do we see that? And I'll throw that out to, uh, to really anybody who would like to take it. Well, I'll just you know quickly say that ultimately, I, I agree with Tyson that the idea is not to create this as, as a choice between the United States and China, but ultimately Europeans will need to realize that their longer term concerns about data privacy, their longer term uh, concerns about environmental issues, the things that they put on their agenda um, will not be consistent with a long term closer uh, EU China relationship. I mean, there, there will ultimately be um, a clash, a, a clash there or a disconnect there. So that's a, a little bit how I how I see it. Um, that. Uh, Certainly, China's not preserving the privacy of data in any uh, systematic way. So these, uh, and certainly in my view, China's also long-term actually has a very different agenda vis-a-vis -vis the environment than the Europeans. Um, so I think if you pick sort of the three to five key issues that, that Europeans think are important, um, if they actually draw out how those are likely to unfold, it's hard to see that, um, that it's within the, con within the context of a closer EU China relationship. That's it. Thanks. Peter, I would just comment that <clears throat> I, I'm not quite sure how the uh, quad, for instance, is, is going to play out. There are differences, um, especially with India. But that being said, and, and you know, some of the very technical issues we've discussed, uh, India is, is not in the same place we are, not likely to be anytime soon, even though, you know, we could conceive of, for instance, some uh, uh, production of hardware um, and maybe research uh, where India has certain skills, um, both in production and research software, um, some expertise in biopharmaceuticals. Um, but, the other parts of the quad, uh, Japan and Aust Australia, um, are pretty much fully on board with what the United States is trying to do vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, and uh, Japan is still a significant technology power. Uh, if we could bring in Korea, um, you know, and, the, and, and, and Taiwan for that matter, um, Singapore maybe, you know, the, generally they're technologically sophisticated, have a lot to offer, the, the, 
a lot of uh, ways in which we could um, cooperate with them. I mean, just take Japan on semiconductors and uh, telecommunications technology, uh, both hardware and they're some, somewhat of a leader in open RAN type solutions as well. Um, there's a lot to be gained by uh, bringing them in. We had in the, you know, somewhat related the uh, World Trade Organization discussions between the, the, uh, the trilat so-called trilateral discussions on WTO reform, US, EU, uh, Japan, actually reached some pretty good uh, conclusions in language about uh, where to go on terms of industrial subsidies in the WTO. Uh, so that was just one sign that I think that there's, uh, there, there's the chance to broaden this out. So it's not just a choice between the U or for, for the Europeans uh, between the United States and China. There are other parts of the world, some of which are uh, uh, big, you know, potent, potentially bigger, and some of which are very technologically sophisticated and can be very useful in um, developing, you know, more resilient supply chains to adopt the, uh, you know, the cliches we're all throwing around these days. Tyson, do you think that um, that uh, the Quad or sort of AUKUS is shadowing these commissioners as they as they appear in Pittsburgh, or are those really almost separate parts of the European brain? Uh, no, it's definitely it's definitely shadowing the the negotiations. Um, in mainly in the sense that, and this is this is terrible to say, but Europe doesn't feel like it has been, and this is a perennial issue. And I know we have many people who work in government, so they know this uh, hasn't gotten the kind of consultation that it. it deserves and its member states deserve. And I think they have a case to be made, as was mentioned uh, with Afghanistan, with AUKUS, with certain states regarding Nord Stream 2. There was a lot of gardening that needed a lot of advance work that was just not done um, that left a lot of um, residual impact, I would say. And that's going to be it's going to be part of the kind of atmospherics around the TTC, there's no doubt. But I would also say that in some ways, if you look at the areas where Europe is looking to make real offensive uh, moves, interests in, uh, in Pittsburgh around dual use export controls and investment screening, it's really about convergence with the United States. It's about creating a democratic space for technology um, and really thinking about how we can harden our external borders to authoritarian states, primarily China. Um, the commission is really doing a lot of proxy work for the United States and member states, first and foremost, Germany, in trying to create the kind of um, policy and regulatory infrastructure on some of these questions that will start to get Germans to reconsider some of these things. And I'll give you one example on investment screening. Uh, the European Union pushed through a, a new investment screening uh, framework uh, last year, which uh, led to Germany re revising its framework and has led to new hires. I was talking to somebody at the uh, defense ministry here, and he said that they had hired 10 new people, primarily just to manage workload for screening uh, Chinese investment in Germany. And that there have been some cases noted by the public, including in the gaming sector, for example. Um, there was just over the weekend questions the German cybersecurity agency is looking at Xiaomi and Huawei handsets uh, for their potential to uh, censor their censorship capabilities based on reports out of Lithuania. So there is a, a lot of movement and convergence to, towards a U.S. Uh, way of looking at things, particularly around some of these kind of market access, technological access questions in, in investment screening and export controls. And that could eventually lead to also questions around data flows, which is also quite important. And, and uh, trustworthy vendors, I should add. Well, maybe as a closing round then, um, <clears throat> related to the TTC, what, what are the agenda items that we think really are most essential? If we do need to prioritize, as Nadia puts it, and not have a process-based forum that doesn't eventually produce concrete goals, and I do think that's a that's a that's a serious concern heading into this process. 
those two areas which you just mentioned, if I again could put on my panelist rather than moderator hat, seem to matter to me as much as anything else, which is FDI controls and export controls, given that uh, if the Americans you know, lock their door, but the window of Europe remains open for theft of intellectual property, um, what's really the point? You're just basically damaging American exporters rather than really locking down key technologies. So those strike me as two areas that, um, that we could forge greater alignment and coordination on. Um, maybe Tyson, if you wanna go first, what's, what's your hope, your dream? Uh, if Tyson Barker were king, <laughs> Uh, what would he want to see have happen coming out of Pittsburgh and then, um, you know, heading into 2022? Okay, my dream, and we're going to see all of it, but in a much less ambitious scope, would be a strategic interdependence. So a real development of a semi high-end semiconductor ecosystem that supports both sides of the Atlantic in a balanced way. Um, I'd like to see what I call democratic autonomy, which is, you know, deepening uh, the data tech space within democratic countries, including those in Asia, and hardening the borders to make sure that access to that uh, democratic tech space is uh, comes with certain conditions that are met, um, and uh, joint action on shaping the global digital rule book. Um, I think we'll see one area in which we'll see some movement in data governance, which is on questions around illegal content. Uh, and codes of conduct, codes of practice for platforms. But I don't think we'll see necessarily where we've discussed a movement on a privacy shield and some of these other things. So those would be the big three. Great, Tom, do you have any thoughts on what you'd like to see coming out of the- Well, yeah. this may be uh, too aspirational, but I mean, in the long run, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of um, everything that, um, Tyson articulated, um, and I would like to see this process work. Um, I, I'm a little bit more <clears throat> worried about a headlong rush into um, industrial policy and spending a lot of money on industrial policy. I, I mean, I, 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 in general, I don't think it always works very well, and plenty of examples, but there seems to be uh, a little bit of a danger of um, you know competitive um, uh, competition between the the U.S. and the EU. Um, you know, it's semiconductors, it's cloud, it's um, lots of lots of hardware. Um, so I would like to see a dis at least a start of discussion about the relative merits of. Uh, cooperation on basic research, and you know, um, I, I mentioned several areas that I semiconductors is one, um, battery technology. There are lots of them, quantum computing, but this this divide uh, balance. Let's put it as a balance between uh, uh, developing the ecosystems, including support for basic research and uh, outright support to individual companies to build things or develop products. I'd like to see some uh, meeting of the minds on the best balance between those, those elements of, uh, of technology policy. Nadia? I'll just add one, one point, um, standard setting, tech agreement on technical standards and actually an agenda for doing it. If I read one more pacer, paper or communique statement, you know, over the past three years, um, we've been saying this, and it's it's sort of a boundable problem. This is not, it, it shouldn't be that hard. We should be able to organize an agenda, get the right people in the right place, and actually start to make progress on it. And what I would ask the TTC to do then is to report out on, on really what, you know, their progress on that. It's a boundable problem. It's important, and it underlies a lot of these other issues as well. Well, thank you, Nadia, Tom, and Tyson. Uh, to read more from uh, Tyson, go to dgap.org. Nadia and Tom, you can find on hudson.org. Thanks a lot for uh, watching, and we look forward to seeing you at the next Hudson event. Have a good day.